My name is Anatole Kreitzer, and I'm a senior investigator at the Gladstone Institute at UCSF, and I'm also a director of the UCSF Neuroscience Program. My lab works on the basal ganglia, which are a conserved set of brain nuclei uh, involved in motor control, motor planning, and also in a variety of neurological disorders, including Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, addiction, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, Tourette's, and many others. They're really these kind of two distinct roles of the basal ganglia. We know that, for example, in Parkinson's disease, you know, disruptions of the basal ganglia cause you know, tremor and really difficulties initiating movement. Really, motor control is affected. Yet we also know the basal ganglia is involved uh, in learning, learning habits, learning action sequences. And so it's, you know, been, I think, a critical question to understand, you know, how, does, how are these various functions of the basal ganglia performed? The striatum is this core nucleus of the basal ganglia. And there are these output neurons called medium spiny neurons, but there are also this small population of interneurons, fast spiking interneurons, and function of those interneurons was really not that well understood. There was some human autopsy data that indicated that in patients with Tourette's syndrome, there were actually uh, fewer numbers of these fast spiking interneurons. And so that really led us to a hypothesis that uh, these interneurons were important for normal motor control. The first experiment we did, we just took the fast spiking cells out of the circuit. And our prediction was that we were going to see uh, pretty robust dyskinesias, unwanted movements, over grooming, all the sorts of things you might expect um, if you had so called hyperkinetic movement disorder. But instead, the animals performed movements in a very perfectly normal way. We were unable to distinguish animals that had their fast spiking interneurons lesioned from wild-type control animals, and that was a huge surprise to us. But instead, when we had these animals learn simple tasks that involved the striatum, we found that they were slower to learn those tasks. And we ultimately realized that that was because of the way in which fast spiking interneurons were controlling synaptic plasticity in the striatum. At that point, we wanted to understand a little bit more about what these cells were doing in the circuit. So we did some initial recording studies using electrophysiology. Uh, and what we found there was that when fast spiking interneurons were missing, when we took them out of the circuit, we saw that medium spiny neurons, the principal cells, actually tended to fire in bursts a little bit more often. And that was kind of interesting because the burst firing had been implicated in synaptic plasticity, uh, calcium influx, and so it implied but did, not, but did not directly show that there might be some regulation of synaptic plasticity that was occurring through these fast spiking interneurons. The next step was a fortuitous one, and that involved the collaboration with endoscopics. Um, because what we really needed to show was that in these awake behaving animals, that if you take fast spiking cells out of the circuit, you get more burst firing. Um, what is the implication of that? Is it enough bursting to actually get calcium entry? Because calcium entry, in turn, we know is important for synaptic plasticity. So we really needed to establish that. And it would have been impossible for us to really directly address uh, whether fast spiking interneurons were influencing calcium influx into, into the neural network without the invoked microscope. To do this, we used a uh, parvalbumin Cree lime with high penetrance in striatum. We injected a Cree dependent virus expressing halorhodopsin, so that's now going to be directed specifically to the fast spiking cells. Uh, at the same time, we expressed the calcium indicator, GCAM6F, uh, using a synapsin promoter. Uh, across all of the neurons in the striatum, about 95% of which are medium spiny neurons. And so what this did was allowed us to image calcium broadly across the network, which are largely medium spiny neurons, uh, while at the same time uh, suppressing fast spiking cells uh, that are expressing halorhodopsin. So what we see in medium spiny neurons at baseline are these very rare, maybe once every 10 second bursts of calcium transients 
that occur typically align to movement. Now when we suppress the fast spiking cells, we see something pretty dramatic. And we see essentially what look like fireworks. We see large numbers of medium spiking neurons now firing calcium transients. And that's really, you know, within the period of time that we're suppressing FSIs, and then we turn the LED off, and now the network kind of becomes quiescent again. So it's a really dramatic change in calcium influx. And the implications of that are that you have aberrant synaptic plasticity occurring in cells and at synapses uh, when it really shouldn't be occurring, and that in turn is gonna interfere with proper motor learning. Mm -hmm.